Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear the opening chapter of Peter Lightheart's book, The Promise of His Appearing, an exposition of 2 Peter. Chapter 1. The First Century Context This book is not a technical commentary on the Greek text of 2 Peter, though the Greek will be appealed to as necessary, or when I want to show off, and it does not give a detailed exposition of every verse of the letter. Instead, it lays out a broad interpretation of the letter, and, more importantly, it lays out a broad interpretive framework for it. To do this, I will focus on a set of specific issues within the letter, all of which are related in some way to the eschatological teaching of the book, which I argue is central to Peter's intentions. No doubt I have made some errors of interpretation on small, and perhaps even larger, issues but I hope that this reading is plausible enough to make some contribution to the scholarship on the epistle and to shift the context for discussion of its contents. A significant shift in orientation and context is, I believe, necessary to make sense both of Second Peter and of New Testament eschatology generally. The sort of shift I hope for can be easily stated. I offer a preterist reading of Second Peter and hope that this book will contribute to making the preterist framework of interpretation a more reputable player in New Testament studies. Preterism is the view that prophecies about an imminent day of judgment scattered throughout the New Testament were fulfilled in the apostolic age by the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, the event that brought a final end to the structures and orders of the Old Creation or Old Covenant. Within this framework, Peter is dealing with issues facing the churches of the first century as the day approaches when the old world will be destroyed. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. And I argue that Peter wrote his second letter to remind readers of that specific prophecy of Jesus and to encourage them to cling to that promise of his appearing. For the purposes of this book, preterism is not merely a way of interpreting New Testament prophecy, but also provides a framework for understanding New Testament theology as a whole. In part, this is nothing more than an effort to understand the New Testament in its historical context. The issues and debates that dominated the New Testament era were largely about the relation of Jews and Gentiles, and derived directly from the gospel's announcement of a new people of God, within which circumcision and uncircumcision are equally meaningless. Preterist interpretation means trying to understand the New Testament in the light of this struggle, without retrojecting post-Reformation debates into the text. Further, an important goal of preterist interpretation is to reckon with the influence that the threat and promise of Jesus' imminent coming which affects nearly every book of the New Testament, had on the shape of New Testament theology. For example, a preterist framework generates such questions as, is it possible that the typology of the church in the wilderness, in Hebrews for instance, had a specific reference to the first century situation? And what is unique about the organization, worship, and life of the church in the period between A.D. 30 and 70? And, what unique role did the first century church play in redemptive history, and how is this related to the fall of Jerusalem? Though preterist interpretations have been around for several centuries, only in the past several decades has this view been endorsed by Protestant interpreters. A number of conservative Reformed commentators, notably J. Marcellus Kick, Kenneth Gentry, David Chilton, Gary DeMar, R.C. Sproul and James Jordan have defended some variety of preterism, and in mainstream New Testament studies, a preterist interpretation of Jesus' little apocalypse has been promoted by J.B. Caird, N.T. Wright, Marcus Borg, and others. These commentators all agree that Jesus describes the end of the Old Covenant order, or Judaism, by using language of cosmic collapse, and several argue that John does the same in Revelation. Revelation. 
The prophecies of Second Peter chapter 3 have also been interpreted as foretelling the final collapse of the old creation in A.D. 70. For example, centuries ago John Owen linked the language of Second Peter chapter 3 verses 8 through 13 with the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 65 to argue that Peter was not predicting the end of the physical universe, but the end of the old covenant order. David Chilton followed Owen in this conclusion, and more recently John Noe and others have presented similar arguments. Mainstream evangelical and liberal commentators on Second Peter, however, continue to be almost completely unaware of preterism as an interpretive option. In a sense, mainstream scholarship's failure to consider preterist treatments of Second Peter is the understandable result of the weakness of the preterist readings of the book that have generally been offered. David Chilton's treatment, for example, focuses exclusively on Second Peter chapter 3, since that is the chapter which is most overtly eschatological. To be fair, it should be said that Chilton's discussion takes place in the context of a commentary on Revelation chapter 21 verse 1, so he can hardly be expected to treat the entire book of Second Peter. Yet this same narrow attention to chapter 3 is characteristic of preterist treatments that I have seen elsewhere. The important question of whether Second Peter predicts an event that took place in the first century has overshadowed the equally important questions of how chapter 3 fits with the rest of Peter's letter, and whether the whole of the letter might be understood preteristically. Another difficulty with Chilton's treatment is that he is content to point to passages where the destruction of the heavens and earth is obviously used to describe an historical event, the collapse of a political religious order. It is increasingly acknowledged among New Testament scholars that this language can be used in this metaphorical sense, but it also has to be established that Peter is using this terminology in this way. The language of the resurrection, to take a parallel example, can be used to describe Israel's national resurrection, e.g. Ezekiel chapter 37, but the church has never taken the resurrection of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in this sense. I cannot say that this commentary moves from possibility to absolute certainty, but I hope to show that within Second Peter, the probability that Peter is using the terminology metaphorically is quite high. Finally, I should note that many of the preterist interpretations of Peter's letter have been offered by commentators who believe that all New Testament prophecies were fulfilled in A.D. 70, even the resurrection of the dead that Paul predicts in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This book will not address this viewpoint in any detail, but I must register my strong disagreement with it, since I consider it heretical. Though commentators sometimes twist 1 Corinthians chapter 15 into a prophecy of the national resurrection of Israel or a description of the bodiless life after death, it is perfectly evident in the context that this is not what Paul is talking about. To come to the latter conclusion, one must thoroughly overturn the common biblical understanding of resurrection, turning it into what N.T. Wright has recently called a new and exciting way of speaking about death. But the structural premise of Paul's entire argument is the parallel between Jesus' resurrection and ours, and Jesus was at pains to show his disciples that he rose from the dead with a body that could consume food, that had bones, that could be touched and felt, e.g. Luke chapter 24, verse 39. Resurrection, to cite right again, is not life after death, but life after life after death. Nor can 1 Corinthians 15 be a description of the national resurrection of Israel, the formation of a new Israel during the first century. While such a resurrection of Israel did occur in the first century, Paul is not talking about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The resurrection that Paul describes will occur at the end, when all rule and authority has been subjugated to the reign of Jesus, and when the last enemy, death, has been defeated. Verses 24 through 26. Again, if language means anything at all, this cannot be a description of something that happened in the first century, for it is too obvious to mention that death has not been defeated. 
Paul is not talking about what John calls the first resurrection, whatever that might be, but about the resurrection that takes place after the millennium, the resurrection to judgment, the resurrection followed by the final evacuation of death and Hades. Further, the hyperpreterist must reduce the millennium of Revelation chapter 20 to a symbolic description of a forty-year period between the resurrection of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem. Whatever the difficulties of Revelation chapter 20, one clear conclusion is that the thousand years symbolizes a significant period of time. When not used literally, the number one thousand is used consistently to describe things that are literally far more than one thousand. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. Psalms chapter 50, verse 10. For a thousand years in thy sight are like yesterday, when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. Psalms chapter 90, verse 4. He remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Psalms chapter 105, verse 8. It is nonsense to use one thousand years to symbolize a generation. By arguing that the entire letter is about Jesus' prophecy concerning the coming crisis of Jerusalem and Judaism, therefore, I hope to bolster the preterist interpretation of chapter 3 and make the preterist framework more plausible to students of Second Peter. To gain a hearing, however, I aim for much more than a hearing, for... I will argue that the argument of the letter is only coherent if it is interpreted in a preterist framework. Along the way, therefore, I highlight five reasons, bold-faced, indented, and labeled as knockdown arguments for the reader's convenience, why the letter must be interpreted preteristically if it is going to be accepted as a genuine letter at all. By the end of the book, I expect the opposing views to be lying on the canvas in a state of semi-consciousness. But the best argument for a preterist interpretation of Second Peter will be the sense it is able to make of the letter as a whole. Persuasion, if it comes, will come more through abduction than deduction. Who wrote Second Peter to whom? Questions of authorship, date, and original audience can seem like the tedious preoccupations of theological nerds. There is a good reason for that perception. These discussions are often tedious when they are not far worse. Yet several introductory questions are relevant to my interpretation of Second Peter and require some attention. This section might be labeled, Please Bear with the Nerd. Even in the early church, the letter's authenticity was questioned. Although Origen referred to it without hesitation, Eusebius mentioned that Peter left one disputed epistle. Nowadays it is common, even among evangelical commentators, to see the letter as an example of pseudo-epigrapha, a work written under the name of an authoritative figure by someone else. Scholars deny Peter's authorship for various reasons. Some understand the personal allusions contained in the book as a literary device, common in ancient pseudo-epigraphic writings. The self-identification of the author as Simeon Peter rather than Peter, cross-reference 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, it is argued, is an obvious attempt by the author to link himself with the Simon Peter of Gospels. The claim to be an eyewitness on the Mount of Transfiguration, chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, is another of the author's clumsy attempts to cloak himself in Peter's mantle, but to the discerning modern scholar the phrase Holy Mountain, chapter 1, verse 18, gives him away as a second-century Christian who is interested in shrines and holy spaces in a way that the real Peter could not have been. The author gives himself away again in chapter 3, verse 16, by referring to all of Paul's letters as a fixed collection, which reveals again that he is living much later than the middle of the first century and he blunders royally in chapter 3, verse 4, when he describes the first generation of Christians as fathers who have fallen asleep, for how can he be Peter if the apostolic generation is dead? 
Some have argued, furthermore, that the situation described by the epistle is too late for Peter's day. Peter died circa the year 65. Since the heresies described in 2 Peter 2 are like 2nd century Gnosticism, and it is, of course, impossible that there could be any 1st century movements like them. Other scholars have pointed out the marked difference in style between 1 Peter and 2 Peter, pointing out, rightly, that the Greek style of the latter is far more stilted and ornamented than that of the former, and recognizing that it is improbable that a single writer could write, say, both children's tales about adventures in a world called Narnia, and erudite historical studies of English literature. In content, finally, the book employs a number of Hellenistic terms and concepts that would have been over the head of a Galilean fisherman. I will not take time to defend Petrine authorship in any thorough way, though I trust the reader has caught the drift of my views from the sarcastic tone of the preceding paragraph. Still, several points need to be addressed more directly. Clearly, a preterist reading of Second Peter, one that claims that the letter is concerned with the end of the old creation in A.D. 70, has an investment in the authorship question. If, as is commonly believed, Peter died under Nero in the mid-sixties, and if Peter wrote the letter, then the letter must have been written before the fall of Jerusalem. Assuming that Peter died before A.D. 70, there are a number of logical possibilities. A. Peter wrote the letter prior to A.D. 70. B. Someone wrote the letter under Peter's name prior to A.D. 70. C. Someone wrote the letter under Peter's name after A.D. 70. Options A and B could support a preterist interpretation, though neither requires a preterist interpretation, but option C implies that the letter is not about A.D. 70, or, if it is about A.D. 70, it is not a prophecy, since it was written after the fact. Most contemporary scholars prefer option C, but there is one decisive reason why this must be rejected, and this same reason establishes option A as the only possibility, assuming that the writer is the least bit honest. In chapter 1, verse 16, Peter assures his readers that the prophecies he reminds them about are reliable, since he was an eyewitness of the majesty of Christ on the holy mountain of the Transfiguration. The problem here is not simply a moral one, i.e. the fact that if the writer is not Peter, he is lying about being an eyewitness to the Transfiguration. Commentators normally dodge this objection by saying that all the readers would have recognized the pseudo-epigraphic nature of the letter and would have played along. The author's claim to have been with Jesus on the mountain would have been no more a lie than Lou Wallace's claim that Ben-Hur witnessed the crucifixion. Fiction is not subject to the same standards of truth and falsity as a historical record. We suspend disbelief and play along. The idea that pseudo-epigraphic writings were common and commonly accepted in the early church is in fact untrue. Church fathers frequently condemned pseudo-epigrapha as forgeries and without any authority. The more serious problem, however, is internal to Second Peter. The argument of chapter 1 simply collapses if Peter is not Peter. Peter cites his presence at the Transfiguration to prove that the prophetic word can be relied on. If Peter was already dead, and someone else was writing under his name, the writer's opponents would have an obvious response. No, you weren't. The mockers who are denying the promise of his coming, chapter 1, verse 16, chapter 3, verse 4, would not be impressed with the claim that the promise of Jesus' coming was backed up by an eyewitness who was not really an eyewitness. I'm with the fathers. If the writer was not Peter, then he was an unscrupulous liar who is not worthy of our confidence in any other respect. Neither option B nor C can handle Peter's affirmation in chapter 1, verse 16. 
And if the letter has a persuasive and coherent argument at all, then it must have been written by Peter. And if Peter wrote the letter, then it must have been written before the fall of Jerusalem. But to whom? Aliens of the Diaspora The recipients of Second Peter are not named in the book, but there are several hints and clues that help to identify them, at least in general terms. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1, Peter says, This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Possibly Peter means a letter no longer extant, but it is more likely that he is referring to the letter that we have in our Bibles as First Peter. The strongest evidence for this comes from a comparison of the phrasing and themes of the two letters. John H. Eliot's summary is worth citing. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 1, Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 1, Peter. Cross-reference, chapter 3, verse 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 1, etc., elect. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 10, election. Cross-reference, Jude, verse 2. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 2, greeting. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 2, cross-reference, Jude, verse 2. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 17, Father. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 7 and 13, chapter 4, verse 13, chapter 5, verses 1 and 4. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 16, Revelation coming of. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 7, etc., glory. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3, etc. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, prophets. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 20 through 21, chapter 3, verse 2. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, etc., holy. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 11 and 14, Jude, verse 20. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 15 and 19, spotless. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 14. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 17, chapter 4, verses 5 and 17, judgment. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter 1, verse 19, spotless. Chapter 3, verse 14, cross-reference, chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 22, Chapter 2, verse 17, chapter 3, verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8, chapter 5, verse 9, love. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 7. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 12, chapter 3, verse 2, apotuo. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 16. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 16, freedom. 2 Peter, Chapter 2, verse 19. 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 19. Disobedient angel spirits. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 4. Cross-reference, Jude 6. 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 20. Noah, flood. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 5. And chapter 3, verse 6. 1 Peter, chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. Dissipation of unbelievers. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 5. In chapter 3, verse 6. 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 7. End of all things. 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 11, D. Doxology. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 18, B. 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 19, Creator. 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 5. The fact that both letters deal with Jesus' coming is of particular importance for my purposes. Peter says specifically that he had earlier taught his readers about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. And in chapter 3, he reminds them of teaching them about the events of the last days and the promise of a new heavens and new earth, chapter 3, verse 3 and 13. In both cases, 
Peter says that he was simply reminding readers of what he had already told them, in the first letter at least, and perhaps also in other ways. Chapter 3, verse 1. The last days and the coming day of judgment are themes of First Peter. As Eliot's list indicates, a coming judgment or revelation is mentioned several times in First Peter. You are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Chapter 1, verse 5 In this affliction you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various temptations, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 Gird the loins of your mind for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verse 13 The Gentiles are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you. But they shall give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. The end of all things is at hand. Chapter 4, verse 4 through 5, and verse 7. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exultation. Chapter 4, verse 13. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading wreath of glory. Chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 4. In several of these passages, Peter explicitly states that there is an event on his reader's immediate horizon. Even some of the passages that lack an explicit time reference refer to an event that is about to happen. The revelation of Jesus Christ in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 and chapter 1, verse 13 is doubtless the same event as the coming of a salvation to be revealed in the last time, in chapter 1, verse 5, and therefore the time reference of chapter 1, verse 5, ready to be revealed, applies also to the manifestation of Jesus in verses 7 and 13. The revelation of Jesus, moreover, is likely the same event as the appearance of the chief shepherd. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. Given these passages, it makes sense for Peter to say that he has already made known to you the power and coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, and that his second letter is written to remind his readers of words spoken beforehand by your apostles, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, including Peter himself. The connection between 1 and 2 Peter makes a prima facie case for a preterist interpretation of the latter. If 1 Peter is about a revelation that is ready to come, about an end of all things that is at hand, about a judgment that is ready to begin at the house of God, then Second Peter, which is a reminder of things taught in the previous letter, must be about the same topic. Anyone reading the second letter with a knowledge of the first, which Peter assumes, would naturally assume that he was talking about the same imminent coming that he talked about in the earlier letter. Knockdown Argument Number One Peter wrote his second letter on the theme of the coming of Jesus, which he says was also a theme of his first letter, which is 1 Peter. Since 1 Peter's teaching about the coming of Jesus highlights its imminence, 2 Peter must be dealing with the same looming event. If Peter wrote both letters to the same Christians, who are these recipients? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, describes them as those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Asia Minor. Aliens 
is a literal description of their geographic and political condition rather than a description of a spiritual condition. They are residing in an alien land rather than in their homeland. Peter also describes them as being scattered, employing a Greek word related to diaspora. By Peter's time, diaspora had become a technical term for the dispersion of the Jews from the time of the Babylonian captivity, and so it is possible that Peter is writing to these scattered Jews, living as aliens outside the land of promise. If so, these are Jewish believers, not Jews in general. They are a chosen people, as Israel was, but they are chosen to obey Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, and they are awaiting the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter may be writing, then, to diaspora Jews who converted to Christ through the preaching of various apostles, perhaps including Paul. That the recipients are Jewish believers may be supported by Peter's use of Old Testament terms and phrases to describe them and their relationship with Jesus. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone laid in Zion. Those who are outside the community are Gentiles, and therefore the recipients are to think of themselves as Jews. Even the description, not being a people, is drawn from Hosea's description of the adultery and restoration of Israel. According to Hosea, Yahweh treated them as not a people, but then wooed them back to become his people. Yet commentators on 1 Peter almost all agree that the letter was written to Gentiles and give several arguments to support this conclusion. One is that Peter describes his readers as formerly being controlled by lust and ignorance, committed to a futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. These seem to describe people who have formerly been worshippers of vain or futile idols. Further, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, recall that the readers have engaged in abominable idolatries. I do not find these arguments for a Gentile audience persuasive. Peter recognized that the Jews were ignorant in regard to Christ, and even Peter's description of the futile way of life inherited from their forefathers and their idolatries might reasonably be applied to Jews. For many centuries, after all, Israel had been a nation of idolaters, setting up high places, worshipping Baals and Asherah, burning incense to golden calves. Paul certainly was capable of describing Israel's history as a history of futility and idolatry. In Romans 1, he brings God's case against humanity in general, but his indictment includes a sharp attack on Jews in particular. When Paul says that foolish men have exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures, Romans chapter 1 verse 23, he is quoting from Psalm chapter 106, which is a poetic description of the golden calf incident. Israel, as much as the Gentiles, or more, had exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator. Jews, as much as Gentiles, became futile in their speculations, Romans chapter 1 verse 21, and the word futile here is the verb form of the noun used in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18, Mateus Mateu. More generally, it is not at all unusual for Scripture to describe the Israelites' idolatry as leading to futility, even futility inherited from the fathers. Thus says Yahweh, What injustice did your fathers find in me, that they went far from me and walked after emptiness? Septuagint Mateus, and became empty. Septuagint Mateu. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 5. Thus says Yahweh, do not learn the ways of the nations, for the customs of the peoples are futility, Septuagint Mateos. Because it is wood cut from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. Every man is stupid, devoid of knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols, for his molten images are deceitful, and there is no breath in them. They are worthless, Septuagint Mateos.
a work of mockery. In the time of their punishment they will perish. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. These references from Jeremiah are particularly important. Jeremiah was warning Judah and Jerusalem of an impending catastrophe because of their devotion to futility. Peter, an apostolic Jeremiah, as well as an apostolic Moses, see below, does the same. The Jewish forefathers' way of life was futile in several ways. In Romans, Paul charges that they inherited futile idolatry and human traditions, following in the ways of their fathers, just as many of the kings of Judah and Israel walked in the ways of idolatrous predecessors. Furthermore, the Old Covenant itself did not achieve the end of final salvation, and thus was ultimately futile. The law, weak through the flesh, could not bring the forgiveness of sins, or the new life of the resurrection. Romans chapter 8, verses 1-4 through 4. While describing the readers as participating in Gentile lusts and idolatries, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, clearly distinguishes between the readers and the Gentiles. With these considerations in mind, I conclude that 1 Peter was addressed to Jewish believers who have been redeemed from Judaism by Christ. By focusing on Peter's use of diaspora, we can be more specific about the circumstances of the original readers. Though this term was used in Jewish literature to describe the scattering of Jews following the exile, the New Testament uses the word predominantly for another scattering. After Stephen was stoned, Jews led by Saul began persecuting the church in earnest, and because of this, believers in Jerusalem were scattered. In Acts chapter 8 verse 1, the word is the verbal form of diaspora, and chapter 8 verse 4 repeats the statement. Acts chapter 11 verse 19 mentions others scattered by this persecution, going out as far as Cyprus, Antioch, and Phoenicia, as if picking up on the storyline of chapter 8 verse 1. So then, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. In the very next verse, we read of the first efforts to proclaim Jesus to Gentiles. Chapter 11, verse 20. Thus, the diaspora from Jerusalem led immediately to the Gentile mission, which emanated from Antioch. The New Testament records a diaspora of the Jerusalem church, scattered because of the attack of another Babylon, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, which is Jerusalem. Like other descriptions of Israel, the people, seed of Abraham, sons of God, etc., the New Testament applies diaspora predominantly to the church. This gives us an insight into the situation into which Peter wrote his second letter. The recipients are Jewish believers who are no longer living in Jerusalem, their home city, because of persecution. In 1 Peter, the apostle gives them hope and comfort in the midst of their sufferings, assuring them that a judgment is awaiting their persecutors, which will soon be carried out. Their suffering will be vindicated, the blood of the martyrs will be poured out upon the city, and the avenger of blood will arise to take vengeance. In this context, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 also makes sense. Given the passage of time, it is important for Peter to write again to give reassurances. In his first letter, he had used strong language to convey the imminence of the judgment, the end of all things is near, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, and it is time for judgment to begin from the household of God, chapter 4, verse 17. But time passed, and more and more of the apostles died, and nothing happened. Some, particularly the persecutors whom the church hoped would be judged, began to mock the Christians' expectation and hope for vindication. They raised doubts that the judgment is going to happen at all, and some believers have broken under the pressure. An apostasy is beginning, and the focus is on the failure of Christ to return. Peter writes to assure his readers that what he predicted in his earlier letter will come to pass. Though this reconstruction is admittedly too speculative to use as a basis for a preterist interpretation of Second Peter, it is obviously consistent with such an interpretation.
structure. Second Peter is laid out in roughly a chiastic outline, a fact that will guide us at a number of points in our interpretation of the letter. A. Fruitfulness in Knowledge of Christ, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. B. Reminder of the Power and Coming of Christ, chapter 1, verses 12 through 21. C. False Prophets, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. D. God Knows How to Protect the Righteous, chapter 2, verses 4 through 10a. C. Prime, False Teachers, chapter 2, verse 10b through verse 22. B. Prime, Reminder of the Day of the Lord, chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. A. Prime, Encouragement to Perseverance, chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. In a chiasm, the corresponding sections, for example, A and A prime, share themes, content, or wording. Within Second Peter, there are correspondences between the sections in at least the following ways. A and A prime. The two A sections are connected by verbal links, be diligent, chapter 1, verse 10, verse 15, chapter 3, verse 14, and more generally by the fact that both are exhortations. They are also linked by the theme of knowledge, and by the fact that both contain blessings in the greeting of chapter 1, verse 2, and in the farewell of chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. B and B prime. These sections include a language of remembrance and recollection. Both, moreover, employ the phrase, know this first of all, and both are concerned with the day and the coming of Jesus. Substantively, both sections address doubts about the reliability of Jesus' promise to come to rescue his people. C and C prime. These sections are linked by common concern for false prophecy or false teaching. Chapter 2 begins with a reference to Israel's history of false prophecy, verse 1, and one of these false prophets, Balaam, is mentioned in verses 15 and 16. In both, Peter accuses his opponents of sensuality, apostasy, and false words or heresies. Both sections employ the image of a way or path to describe a manner of living, and both deal with the greed of the opponents. D. The central section of Peter's epistle contains his assurance, based on several Old Testament events, that the Lord will judge and will rescue his own in the midst of judgment. The beginning of this section is fairly clear. Verse 4 turns from a warning about the false prophets to an assurance that the Lord will judge. But the end of the section is more difficult to determine. Verse 9 is the conclusion to the series of if statements, verses 4, 6, and 7. But whether the first half of verse 10 concludes this section or begins another is difficult to determine. I have, based on grammatical considerations that we need not detail, divided verse 10 in the middle, following the NASB and seeing verse 10a as the concluding clause of verse 9, and verse 10b as the beginning of a new section of polemic against the false teachers. One implication of this structure is that the letter is a connected whole, dealing with one main theme, namely the power and coming of Jesus and false prophets who deny his power and coming. The issue of the last days, or the new heavens and new earth, does not arise for the first time at the end of the letter. Given the chiastic connection between the beginning and end, if the timing of day at the beginning can be determined with some certainty, so might the other. If I can show that chapter 1, verses 12 through 21, is about an imminent day of judgment, it will follow that chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, is as well. According to John Breck, chiasms not only function statically with balancing sections on either side of a central section, but also function dynamically, so that the text circles in toward a central point. The first of each pair of corresponding sections makes a statement, which the second of the pair amplifies. The writer says, A, and then, what's more, A prime. With regard to Second Peter, the structure works as follows. A and A prime. Peter urges his readers to put on Christian virtue, A, 
and what's more, warns them before of the challenges they will face in living holy lives. A prime. B and B prime. Peter can testify to the truth of Jesus' promised coming, B, and what's more, this promise will be fulfilled in spite of delays and mockery, B prime. C and C prime. The mockers are not worth listening to because they have denied Jesus, C, and what's more, they will themselves be destroyed, C prime. D. We know that God can and will destroy the false teachers and mockers and rescue his children, because he consistently has done this in the past. In short, the central thrust of the book as a whole is not merely to give information about the coming day of God. Peter's main goal is pastoral, to prepare the flock for difficulties ahead and to assure them that God, the judge of all the earth, will do right and will not let the righteous perish with the wicked when he comes to destroy a new Sodom. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was the first chapter from Peter Lightheart's The Promise of His Appearing, an exposition of Second Peter. If you'd like to hear the rest of the book, you can purchase it at audible.com or anywhere audiobooks are sold.